Warner's Shows brings you three premium railway modelling events throughout the year. Join us this October at the East of England Showground for the National Festival of Railway Modelling. View over 30 hand-picked layouts from a variety of gauges and scales demonstrating excellent hobby skills, including Rivendell, Grange Over Sands, Halland, Orange River, Ellesmere, Sabin's End, Fenchurch St Peter's and Up the Line. Browse and buy hobby items from over 100 traders and pick up new skills from free demonstrations from experts. Book today and save £2 as a BRM subscriber, gain 30 minutes early entry and a free show programme. The next arrival at Platform 9 will be the 0430 AM service from Bristol. Hello viewers of BRM TV and welcome to this special edition presented here from the very platform at Liverpool Lime Street Station. Now, I'm here at the platform head and I'm waiting for three special guests responsible for the creation of this masterpiece. Fortunately, the train hasn't quite arrived in the station yet, so I'm just going to have to hang around for a little bit longer and read this copy of BRM. Attention please, here is a special announcement. A lost little boy answering to the name of John has been handed in to the station supervisor's office. Would his parents or guardian please contact the office immediately please. How are you doing? I'm fine, Howard. How are Les, you? Les, not Hi, so Howard. bad, thanks. You OK, Rob? Fine, thank you, Howard. Well, I've got to admit, it's a great layout, and of course, seeing that canopy once again is brilliant. But I've got to ask you, there's been a few more developments since I've, our last visit at BRM, yeah. so tell us about the sound system. This is all new. It is all completely new, yes. We've developed it now. We've got a six-track sound system. We've got the station announcements. We've got ambient sound. We've got hooters <laughs> and whistles. And then the station announcements and the ambient sound comes out of the one at the back of the station. And it's not just train announcements that you've got either. Uh, you've also got the cancellations or the de de late we arrivals have, as we well. Have, yes, yes, we've got uh, various things. We've got call for the wheel tapper, and if if we happen to have a problem, we can always say that there's been a point failure at Edge Hill. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. That's incredible. But I hear it's not the only thing that you've been busy with uh, on the layout. So what other developments have you been up to? Well, now? we've been busy with the scenery. I've spent the last 12 months preparing and producing the back scene. Wow. Would okay. you like to see it? Yeah, how far is it? Well, we're up we're as far as the um, university. Okay. Uh, and if you're 10 minute walk, Brilliant. if you'd like to come with me. Sure, show the way. Up. Okay. Um, you guys want a copy of BRM? Oh, yeah. Thank you very, very much. much. Yeah, cheers. Yeah. Just out of interest, this uh, back scene that we've got here, tell us a little bit about it. 
This, in fact, is part of the uh, university buildings in Liverpool. Yeah. Um, and I've been working on the back scene. The buildings have been there for quite some time. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we now have the, the, the little people with yeah. us. Um, and uh, you can see on the roadway, for example, that we've started to put in the sets and yeah, colour the... Picked out a few different colours. Colours of, of the sets, that's right, yes, yes. So this area is almost complete and we shall be moving down the layout doing a similar thing as time of permit. So obviously it's a large layout and you're weathering this carefully, picking out each individual set. So how can you be entirely sure that you get the same colours to match the full length of the layout? I guess you're using a, the colour palette's got to be quite restricted, doesn't it? I mix, I mix enough colouring to keep me going for three or four streets. It doesn't matter if the tone alters slightly, provided the basic colour is the same. Yeah. And we finish it, of course, we do the painting and then complete it with a, a dusting of uh, powder. And it works really powder. well, you know, it looks natural. It becomes brown. But tell us about the figures. I mean, the figures have suddenly appeared overnight on the layout, so tell us a little bit about Well, those. the figures, of course, have been produced by Peter Goss. Mm. And uh, he, in fact, will be producing most of the figures for the layout. We've concentrated on figures that will be seen in the university area. I can, I can see there's a, a gentleman stood with, just next to us here with the With the board on, yes. And uh, we, we shall continue down the layout with appropriate figures. Yeah. Uh, not only street scenes, but of course the actual track scene where we shall have uh, track repairmen. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we shall go down to Lime Street where we'll, we'll see members of the public walking up and down Lime Street. Yeah. So Rob, this layout's going to consume quite a few figures, I suspect. How many, roughly? In the region of 2,000. Wow, OK. And I guess Mr Goss has got the job of task. He has a responsibility of, of, of finishing them, yes. Brilliant. Well, we'll look forward to seeing that in its completed form. But Indeed. that's not the only thing that you've been up to uh, oh, you've been away. No, so. further down the layout we have gas lights and one or two other innovations okay. provided by John. So if you'd like to come this sure. way, we'll have a look at Lead them. Lead the way. Thank you. Step yeah, I'm all, yeah, I'm all right now, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good view from up here, though, isn't it? Excellent view. Yeah, you can see the whole station over there. There's the signal box, and that's leading up into the cutting up there. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about these. I mean, I can just see some of them down there. Yeah, these gas lamps. The one by the, the signal box there. Yeah. Well, this is something that we've just got finished uh, last year. It's I call it the three-phase gas supply. Right. But basically, we've got three power supplies for the gas lamps. And one, uh, each supply, as it lights up, it mimics a gas mantle warming up. And when they're going off, they get the little pop at the end. Wow. And they come on in sequence, one after another. So we try to give more of a random effect as they come on. And of course, you're still not um, using DCC on the layout. So all of this yeah. has been, you know, it's going to require a certain amount of electronics underneath the board. Yes, it's all homemade electronics, wow. yeah. Well, we're yeah. going to take a look at that in a bit. I think. Yeah, yes, yeah, go on, Denise. So what's this coming out of the station now? Uh, that one there, that is the Merseyside Express, the 10 a.m. departure. Wow, and we've just got one coming into the station as well. Yeah, that's, that's the TPO, that's the TPO. It's, it's, um, it's one of our trains that we've sort of used a bit of modeler's license for because I do like the TPO view. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, these these uh, light comics that we uh, we're going to take a look at. Yep. Shall we uh, go under the boards and take a look? Why don't we take a, no, a nose down? Okay, down, let's you know, go. Feed me down, Scotty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Watch yourself on them steps. Yeah, we'll do. So whilst all the trains pass merrily on the way above us. Underneath, this is what makes it all tick. It is. This is the heart of the system. Over there, we've got the main control system with the main 
processor that controls the router and everything and then we've got satellites under here all the control systems for the various extra bits that we've added on we were talking earlier on about the sound system yeah. up here we've got the main board for the sound system uh, I told you about having the three wave triggers these are the wave triggers here three okay. of them and then the outputs from those are taken through six individual amplifiers and then from each amplifier it goes out to the various speakers around the layout in each of these there's a little little flash card and on those we can store up to would you believe a thousand soundtracks wow. uh, and that's why we, we we have them in hundred block groups we've yeah. got the 200 block for the sounds for the station announcements and then we do the other things of other hundred block also on here we've got the processor that little thing there is the processor that's actually doing all the control for this but then this umbilical goes to the panel that you saw at the front for the actual um, button box where we actually apply them. Under here as well, over there we've got the video switch for all the cameras that are viewable from the station end and then we've got here the servo board that's controlling 16 individual signal servos. That in turn is controlled by that node behind your head there okay. uh, and we've got all the data coming from the central control box uh, multiplexed out to that and then that sends an analog signal out to each individual signal here either to change or to restore and the, the chip in here there's two signals per chip and that will actually put the bounce and the various movements that we've included for the signals as they change. I mean it's phenomenal I mean this is this is a lifetime's achievement in, in it its is. own unique right but supposing that one of these wires was to go amiss where where would you go? We have the Bible. Okay. Uh, this is a book that goes to every exhibition with us and we just hope that when we get to the show we don't have to use it. Fingers crossed. So what, what's in the Bible? Okay, well it's divided out into sections and there's a section for each baseboard. And within each section, when you open it, it's all the same format. First page we've got, which gives you an overall uh, idea of where the individual droppers come through. The second page shows us the basic general layout of the track and where all the, all the points are. And then we've got a series of pages which show the actual wiring runs from dropper to dropper to dropper to plug and socket. So you've even got, say if a, a wire was to go amiss, you've got the particular board it's on, which pin it's on, the colour of the wire and, and where it, sh where it uh, yes, sh should go to. That's right, the, the chain right the way through. So you can trace it with a, with a, with a metre. I mean, this is phenomenal, John. So yeah. what, what are you going to show me next? I'm going to show you how good I am at cooking sausages. Oh, brilliant. Show the way. Come on. <laughs> Now, we railway modellers are great at putting to use products that aren't designed for use at all on models. Take for instance the humble plaster bandage. How many of us use those to create landscapes? And well, yacht varnish for instance, we're quite good at putting to use to create rivers, streams and various other little water features. But when it comes to actually finding products that are designed for use on our models, we just tend to stick to their intended use. We never seem to put them to new uses. Now take this for instance, it's the Ballast Magic Kit from Deluxe Materials. Now its title is quite obvious, its intent is to ballast your track. But, and this is where railway modellers are quite good at putting products like this to new uses, we're going to show you a few other uses that you can use this product on. It's essentially just a glue. So. How many things can you glue with it? Well, first of all, let's kick off with two wagons that we have here. Now, nothing special about these. They're straight from the box, dapple mineral wagons and a coal wagon. Um, very plain looking, very basic looking. And the first thing that makes your eye stand to attention when you see these is, well, it's the loads, unfortunately. They're just not that detailed. I mean, you can get away with a bit of weathering and painting on the wagons themselves, but you're never really going to get that load looking realistic. So, let's add a little bit of ballast. Um, what we'll do, though, let's get this pack opened up, and I'll show you how easy it is to glue a load into place. Let's get started.
So with everything out of the packet, let's have a look at what you get inside it. Now, this here is the powder itself. Um, it's, well, 125 millilitres. It goes a long way, actually, because you don't need to use it um, that strong with uh, whatever you're using to glue. I mean, they recommend for gluing ballast, it's one part of glue powder to seven parts of whatever you're gluing. So you can imagine seven times this. It's quite a lot of ballast you're going to glue with that. Um, this here is a little 100 milliliter squirty bottle. Now this is only used for applying water over the glue. We'll show you this later on. Very easy to use, very simple. And of course, unlike PVA glue where you need to apply lots of glue to get it to trickle down into your ballast, well, this is a very neat way of just squirting and misting over the top, which means that when you do apply your glue, you're not disturbing any of the ballast on the surface. So it means that your uniform layer of ballast doesn't have any of those little almost river-like formations that you tend to get from where the glue was running off and before it dried. Also very handy inside is this little mixing jug. Now, this can be used with the two spatulas here just to make sure that your glue and whatever you're mixing to glue down onto your layout or wagon or whatever is mixed in a good way, uniformly, and ready to use. So, let's get started with this mineral wagon. Now, the mineral wagon itself, you can see, has a former load. Now, this can be removed if you want and replaced with a little piece of lightweight polystyrene over which you can put then your real ballast load. But for the purposes of filming, and actually I do this with quite a lot of models, we can just keep it in place there as it is. It's not doing any harm whatsoever and it'll actually act as a very useful former. So we just need a very, very thin layer of ballast over that, just enough so that we can hide the load underneath, but not enough to overload the wagon or create too much weight. So let's mix the ballast and glue in a proportion of one part ballast magic to seven parts ballast in this little cup and sprinkle it over the top. <laughs> The good thing with Ballast Magic is that they also provide you with this little nozzle top. Now, all you need to do is just twist the top there just to get the Ballast Magic out and twist it back when not in use. And it's important that you do keep this sealed because the glue will over time, well, deteriorate if you don't. So, first things first, I don't need an awful lot of glue, but I need enough just to pour over the top. and. Well, I'm not doing any precise work in the bottle, so I'm just going to use it as it comes. Just tapping on the edge there to get the glue in. You can see how fine it is. I mean, um, the product is perfect for getting into all those hard to reach areas. Just see how much we've got there. And you can see we've got the right proportion there of glue to ballast. We turn the top on. Now you'll know it's a bit like this is a bit like making a cake if you're into that sort of thing. You know that you've got all the mixtures and ingredients done when it's just one colour. Actually more like mixing cement. And there you have it, ready to use. So pouring this into the wagon, well, very easy. Just take your time. Make sure that you don't get too much over the sides. And you can always come back to this later. Now the good thing as well with Ballast Magic is that um, if you want to remove the glue later on you can just use some hot water and that will dissolve the glue so that whatever you've glued down can be unglued. Try doing that with PVA once it's been done to a strong mix after a few years. Now this is the bit where if you're using traditional PVA when it came to glue, you'd be messing around with an eyedropper after this forever, trying to accurately glue in your little areas of ballast that you've missed the first time you passed round. Not so with Ballast Magic. Now all we're doing here is just misting the top of this with water. We don't want to flood it because if you flood it, well, it's going to take longer to dry. And the good thing with Ballast Magic is it only takes one to two hours to dry in the first place. So. If we respect, as it says in the instructions, it'll be fine. You can see the colour there change instantly. There we have it. Job done. So there you have it. It's very easy to apply loads to all of your wagons and make them look 
far more realistic, so no more excuses. But it's not just wagons that you can use Ballast Magic on. Now it's, like I said, just a glue. So let's take a look at this. It's a box of embankment vegetation from Nock. Now, not two of which are different colours of foliage. Now you've got a darker green there and a lighter green. Now this is supposed to represent the leaves on the actual uh, branches themselves. So I'd go for perhaps a lighter green if you're modelling spring, perhaps even mixing a little bit of the darker colours in there so you don't have it all completely uniform. And the large, slightly darker green there if you're representing summer. Of course, autumn, well, you're going to have different colours altogether. Winter, no leaves at all. Now, sea foam itself is a natural product, and as you can see, it's quite fragile, and lots of it is tangled together. So you'll have to take your time, just take all of these little pieces out, separate themselves, bend them into a sort of shape that you like, looks realistic. You know, it might take a little bit of tweaking to get there, but after all, branches and many shrubs and trees at the side of the lines tend to be a little bit higgledy-piggledy, nothing too neat. So as far as it goes for creating an armature for a tree, it's great. But applying the flock or whatever you want to apply, I mean you can apply this if you want, we'll do both in this little segment, but applying whatever you want for the foliage has always been a messy job because as soon as you dunk this in a glue, I mean lots of people have tended to use PVA in the past, it just makes everything form little PVA blobs left, right and centre, you lose the finesse of your armature there. I mean, if you can actually see how fine and realistic this looks for creating trees, you just lose the detail. So that's where Ballast Magic comes in. It's a great product to glue foliage to all of your trees. But instead of mixing it like we did with the ballast, this time we're going to go the other way around, which means that we'll spray it with water, sprinkle the glue over it, and then apply our flock. Sounds easy, well, that's because it is. Just take a look. So, the two main ingredients out of the box, one piece of sea foam and the foliage you can see there. Now, before you get started, just remove these little remnants of the seed pods. These do tend to accumulate quite a lot around the ends there and don't look realistic. And you need to remove all of those before you start gluing. So, with all of those removed, you can see we've got a basic armature here. If you want to en enhance this and change its shape a little bit, you can always take some branches off the other pieces and glue them appropriately. Now, let's get started applying the glue. So, first things first, a bit of the spray bottle. All I'm going to do is mist this. We don't want to have it absolutely saturated. And this is quite an effective spray bottle, so just go steady with it. So, just about 20 centimetres away, a light mist over the armature. We don't want it dripping wet, and you know that when you see the tiny little drops of moisture on each of the extremities of the branches. So with the top nicely misted, this is where the little fine nozzle comes into action. Of course, we don't want to use an awful lot of glue on this, minimum amount possible, and because I'm going to be sprinkling this over the armature itself, that's why I've got this little container here underneath, just to catch any of the stray bits of glue which we're bound to have. Make sure there's no waste and of course you can reuse it afterwards. So just go steady, all you're going to do is mist it over like a fine powder and you'll notice when it starts to apply you'll start to get some little white areas there of the glue applying over the ends of the armature. So there's not too much waste underneath but just go steady with it because you don't need to use an awful lot of this to glue your foliage into place. Give it a very quick spray of water once again, just to dampen the glue a bit. So we've got the glue to stick to the armature, now we've got the glue nice, damp and sticky. All we need to do now is just sprinkle over some of our foliage. Now for this one I think I'm going to use the lighter green. I'm just going to snip a small corner out there of the packet because we don't want to have the whole top opened up. Open it out a bit. Now remember, you don't tend to see leaves growing underneath on the underside of the branches. So you need to sprinkle it from a height onto the top of your armature rather than upside down. Just go steady because you don't want to apply too much so that it looks completely ridiculous, but 
the same time well just dampen it again with some more glue and reapply the foliage afterwards. You can see it's quite a vibrant green so this would be quite suitable for something in sort of spring, very early summer. You can all come back and change the colours a little bit later on. Within two hours this will be completely dry, ready to use on your layout, wherever you want to put it. And you can see the trunk there, nice natural colour. Doesn't even really need painting, but if you want to model a specific type of tree with a very dark bark, well, just spray it with a can of brown uh, paint just before you start to apply the glue, of course leaving it to dry. So there you have it, two very easy projects that we can all have a go at and of course will enhance many a layout. Anyway, if you'd like to have a go at doing something like this for yourself, well, get yourself a Ballast Magic kit. Visit www.deluxematerials.com or visit your local stockist. Anyway, many more projects are in store for this, so have a go yourselves. Well, John, honestly, thanks very much for your hospitality. It was a great barbecue, and I've really enjoyed myself here taking a trip round uh, Lime Street. But of course, the layout, obviously, it's, it's, something's got to have brought this project on from, from an, the early stages. So how did it all come about? It came about at the age of about five or six, when I was living in Southport. Uh, my mother used to have a boarding house, and so we were always occupied at Christmas. But for New Year, she always used to take me to London. Going to London involved a trip on the Leckie through to Liverpool Exchange and then we get a taxi across to Lime Street and then the journey down to London. And that journey, there's like a little, little picture in my mind that I always remember from about the mid 50s and that was the, the seed which developed into this Mark III Lime Street. So for such a great project, um, you've had some like-minded people help you out on it. Absolutely. Uh, we've just seen having a walk around the layout, but mm. there's something that I've got to ask, and that's how did all of you chaps meet? Because you're all like-minded, so how did it all come about? Well, that's very interesting, really. We, we all met different people at different times in different ways. Uh, Les here, I've probably known the, the longest because we were uh, doing uh, dem, st dem stands at various exhibitions, probably about, what, 30 odd years ago? At least, uh, 40 years. Maybe even 40 years ago. So obviously, I mean, it's a layout of a lifetime, it's a long project and it's, it's taken you a while to get to where you are now, mm -hmm. but where do you go from here? What does the next two, three, perhaps even four years hold in, in store for us? We start to go into the fourth dimension, as I call it now, that's digging in, going into more detail. Uh, we've got Peter Goss on board who's doing figures for us to bring in the details and that. More finer detail on the hotel and uh, the uh, weathering and things like that. There's ballasting, tons of ballasting to do, point rodding, loads of stuff like that. Uh, Les, tell us a little bit about this hotel. I mean, how long have you been working on this project? Well, it all started a bit before that. Um, John asked me to do some work on the station roof when we were demoing together and he just wanted to know where to fit some dowels onto the layout to hold a dummy roof. And I said, well, I can probably do better than dowels. So we designed it on 3D on the, on the laptop and got them 3D printed. And from there, we moved on to the station roof. And then when I finished that, how about doing the hotel, he said. Mm. And that was about seven years ago now. Mm. And it took about five years of design because then we moved on to a foam board white, in effect, concept model, just to see how big it would look. And from there, finished the design of it, and then it took about 18 months to build it. And a couple of days ago, I finished it. I mean, that's and got to be a mammoth building to measure and get accurate. So how did you go about getting all the dimensions <laughs> for the individual pillars and the windows? And Mainly from photographs. I went down to Lime Street, took all the photographs. The building still exists. It's now student accommodation for Liverpool University. And that's about 500 photographs. And we've also got 
the architect's drawings mm -hmm. for the modifications to the hotel when it was converted to students' accommodation. Wow. So we got the main dimensions from that and then mm -hmm. the details from all the photographs. Well, I'm sure you'll agree that Liverpool Lime Street truly is a project of a lifetime. It's taken numerous years for these chaps to get where they are today and it's still not finished yet, so there's quite a few more years required to get it to its completed state. But if you'd like to see it in person, you can visit the National Festival of Railway Modelling at Peterborough Showground this October 15th and 16th and see it for yourself and be sure to say hello to the guys and enjoy your time there. Anyway, from all of us here at BRM TV, until next episode, take care. Cheers guys. Cheers. Cheers. This is a mole and he lives in a hole. In the current issue of BRM, we've shown you how I've made a little diorama using the uh, Bush 3 Mole Kit. And I thought with the DVD available, it'd be great fun to show you not only the diorama working, because everybody wants to see little moles coming up and down out of the ground, but we'll also take the thing apart and let's have a look and see what's going on underneath the uh, grass there. Extracting the little mechanism from the garden. Here we have a 95mm square box, 55mm deep, made of laser cut MDF that contains all the gubbins to make the moles work. Turning the box over, we find a bright yellow AC motor. Uh, it is an AC motor, give it DC, and it just clicks and does nothing. On the side, you can see a red switch that alters the direction. Removing the mechanism is pretty easy. It's held into place with four posi drive screws and uh, therefore is nice and easily accessible. Of course, the business end is the moles and in HO scale, you can see they are absolutely tiny. These ones are made of brass, so they've got a bit of weight to slide up and down in their mole hills. And uh, so those moles are driven by a rotating disc which you can see here it's got some raised lugs that are nicely curved they slot into the MDF and just push the moles up and down in their hills hence why they have to be brass and nice and heavy so they'll drop back down again there's no spring pulling them back if we look now and take the disc off you can see that uh, there's a motor powered gear in the main plate and a much larger plastic gear underneath the uh, spinning disc um, and it's held in with a bit of glue and a couple of very bright orange pins that would have been a bit of a mystery when I uh, first started putting the kit together. Simple and reliable, a great way to have another little feature on the layout. You too can have moles in motion. Warner's Shows brings you three premium railway modelling events throughout the year. Join us this October at the East of England Showground for the National Festival of Railway Modelling. View over 30 hand-picked layouts from a variety of gauges and scales demonstrating excellent hobby skills, including Rivendell, Grange Over Sands, Halland, Orange River, Ellesmere, Sabin's End, Fenchurch, St Peter's and up the line. Browse and buy hobby items from over a hundred traders and pick up new skills from free demonstrations from experts.
Book today and save £2 as a BRM subscriber, gain 30 minutes early entry and a free show programme.